Hi there, welcome to Beyond the Briefing. I'm meteorologist J.P. Dice, also ATP and uh, flight instructor, everything in between. I'd like to get with you uh, on a routine basis here on our video series to uh, talk about weather and how it uh, pertains to flying. Uh, one of the things that really excited me, a lot of you guys, I know you get this, the uh, AOPA Pilot Magazine, so I'm th thumbing through it the other day, and I get to uh, page 94. Uh, it's the latest issue, Thomas Horn's article on, can you see this, supercomputing the weather, and he has Pivotal Weather up there, one of my favorite weather model sites. Uh, great information from uh, Thomas Horn about uh, supercomputers and weather model data. Uh, one of the things that I really encourage every one of you to do, don't be afraid of this, go beyond the briefing and get into that weather model data. Pivotalweather.com is a great site to do that. Had a question from one of my former students the other day. He was looking at some skew T information, and we discussed that in one of our earlier videos, how to look at skew T's, and he was looking at the GFS model data, and it was a, a trip that he had two days from now. And I said, hey, stop the presses here. Don't use the GFS. You need to be looking at the, the higher res data because you're within about a two-day window. So start looking at the NAM, the three-kilometer NAM, that's the North American model, or the HRRR, the high-resolution rapid refresh model. The GFS and the Euro, that's typically used when you're looking out uh, about a week or so. Uh, at the uh, television station, when we're assembling the seven-day forecast, we're using GFS and, uh, and Euro data for those days four, five, six, seven, typically. So use the high-resolution data, and if you're using Pivotal Weather, just click on that area on the map, and that will give you the skew T for any place out there. This is really a, a virtual uh, sounding. It's not the same sounding that you get from the weather balloons that are essentially delivered in, in real time when those balloons go up at 12Z and 0Z. So fantastic uh, that uh, AOPA is uh, doing some articles there about uh, weather models and talking about uh, the supercomputers and so forth and, and how weather modeling has really improved over the years. And this is the, the same data that uh, the Weather Service will be using to uh, put together the TAFs that you see, the terminal aerodrome uh, forecast. So I've been going through the NTSB reports and looking at weather things and weather accidents and, and weather fatalities. Uh, sounds morbid that we spend a lot of time on the NTSB reports, but we, we do learn a lot from, from those and we learn what not to do uh, from someone else's mistakes. Sometimes those are fatal mistakes, but we can learn from all of those reports. So I've got a list here. It's, it's a top five aviation weather killers. And one is the inadvertent flight into a thunderstorm. We see that all the time. And we say, why in the world did this person do this? You can even go back and look at the radar data and you can see they're going right into the thunderstorm. And what I tend to think is going on there, I think that you do have people that are using the ADSB or the XM data wrong. They're looking at delayed information. They're not understanding the limitations of that data, and they are finding themselves going into the uh, thunderstorms. So not a good plan there. Always know what kind of data you're looking at, and look at it on the ground before you get into the air. You know, how many of us go out and it's a lousy weather day and we decide to fly? Uh, depending on your equipment, you probably shouldn't do that. If you are in a high-performance aircraft, uh, if you're in a, in a turbine airplane, if you're in something that can get above the weather and get through it rather quickly, maybe a different school of thought. Uh, if you have some redundancies, uh, multi-engines and things like that versus a single-engine airplane. Not all airplanes are created equally. We know that, so we can't treat a, a Cessna 150 like it's a 767. They have different capabilities. Uh, VFR flight in the instrument conditions, and I'm going to go on down the list. Icing, microbursts, microbursts and low-level wind shear are closely uh, related uh, to one another. So VFR in the instrument conditions. If you are a VFR-only pilot, I want you to hear me out here. Uh, I want you to make sure that you are conservative. I want to make sure that you are getting the best weather information possible. And I want to also make sure you go beyond the three hours required of instrument time that you do for the private. Go beyond that. Go out with a flight instructor and get accustomed to flying into some instrument conditions. Even if you're not going to get the instrument rating, it's going to do you some good because there is a time 
that you will find the forecast was wrong or something has happened and you're going to get yourself into instrument conditions. I had it happen to me. I was a, a VFR only pilot and I went a lot of places as a VFR only pilot. I'm coming back from Florida uh, one day. South Georgia, that ceiling starts getting lower and lower and that's not what the TAFs had. You know, it was not planned that way. Ceiling gets lower and lower, and I decided to land in Auburn and wait it out, wait it out for a little bit. It got better, then got back in the air. By golly, the ceiling started getting lower and lower. So I knew, okay, we got to figure out a plan here. So I was able to get low enough under the clouds. I knew where the terrain was, and I basically stayed in, in visual contact with the ground and kind of followed the roads and safely got out of that. But you don't want to be doing that on a frequent basis. I know it happens, but you need to have a plan and need to be able to um, execute that plan. I always say you have to have an escape route. And sometimes it's not only technically instrument conditions. You go out back to the JFK Jr. crash and you have uh, a plane that's flying over the ocean and it's nighttime. There is no visible horizon. There's some haze out there as well and essentially you are IMC. You know, in other countries, you actually have an instrument rating to fly at night. Not here in the United States, but there are moonless, moonless, moonless nights out there where you will not have a visible horizon. Uh, icing. Stay out of it in a small plane in most cases. Uh, not a good plan. Even if you have uh, the ice protection with the weeping wings, remember that is a, a finite, the TKS fluid, that's a finite amount of, uh, of fluid there to give you that ice protection. That basically, I, I say it gets you through a layer, it gets you out of the situation, don't stay in it. And we even know situations, obviously, you guys, some of you have been in it, where the ice can overcome the boots. We saw a situation a few years ago with a TBM uh, up in uh, the Northeast, I believe coming out of Teterboro, where uh, the ice actually overwhelmed the uh, de-ice boots. The heated wings are are much much better situation, but not all airplanes have those. You know, a lot of your uh, your turbo props and and so forth are are going to be using uh, the boots. Microburst and a low level wind shear almost go hand in hand. A microburst divided into two different types. You have the dry microburst and you have the wet microburst. Uh, wet, obviously, there's a lot of rain, and you'll see that rain come down, big rain shaft, and then it slaps the ground, spreads out in all directions. The dry microburst is wind. You see that a lot in the uh, desert southwest, and you will see that also in uh, areas where it is obviously going to be a lot drier. So that's what you have there with the wet versus the dry microburst. So how do you tell the difference between the two? With the uh, dry microburst, you can actually see the dirt uh, kind of kicking up there. And we call them microburst because it is uh, short duration over a small area. And they're hard to forecast. They're hard to forecast. Uh, you, you can look at, as a meteorologist if there's a dry layer in there in the atmosphere, that can help accelerate that wind downward and you have a, a better um, situation for microbursts to form. So microbursts can be very dangerous. We know wind shear, uh, especially you watch the news and you look at historically, you look at some of the air disaster TV shows, you go back to Delta Flight 191 L1011 going into Dallas Fort Worth in 1985 and gets involved into a wind shear type situation. Wind shear by definition is a little different than what you're probably thinking about. Wind shear is the change of direction with, with height, with altitude. Wind shear can happen at any, any altitude. You can have wind shear at 10,000 feet. All that means is the wind may be at one direction at 10,000 feet, at 12,000 feet it's another direction, and at 15,000 feet it's another direction. It's the low level wind shear that is the problem, and that is typically caused by a thunderstorm near the airport. The airplane is in a low energy situation, close to the ground, coming in for landing or maybe departing and gets involved in this. We've learned enough about low-level wind shear that uh, airports have pretty good detection systems. The larger aircraft, airline uh, aircraft, some of the corporate airplanes as well, will have wind shear detection 
terminal Doppler weather radars have been installed in the bigger airports and the Class B airports. So we know a lot. We have a lot of detection and we know how to escape out of that. Uh, folks that have um, airline transport pilot ratings, uh, part of that training these days is wind shear avoidance and wind shear escape, uh, which, uh, you, you know, in, in, a, in a larger airplane, it may be a delayed rotation between V1 and VR to give yourself that uh, better bit of energy to be able to get through something like that if it does occur. So going back again, the top five is basically your accidental flight into thunderstorms, which uh, really goes into looking at your weather data, getting a good weather briefing, looking at model data, looking at real-time information, looking at radar scope, using real-time weather radar if you have that in the airplane, and understanding the limitations of the data link weather like ADS-B, the FIS-B, and also the XM. Uh, VFR in the instrument conditions, use caution there. That can bite a lot of people and get that extra instrument time, uh, even if you're a private only uh, person. Icing, stay out of it. Uh, understand the icing layers. Icing can happen anytime during the year. Cool season, obviously, it is more prevalent. Microbursts and a low level wind shear, there's some visual cues on that, as well as using uh, the tools and the technology that is available to us today. I remember, and in fact, I'm going to show you a little picture here where I was concerned about uh, getting a microburst or maybe even a low level wind shear when I was coming back into the Birmingham airport one time. And you can see these clouds. Oh my gosh. They were scary looking clouds out there to the west. And I'm looking at this line on radar and I'm at the Pell City Airport. And I'm going to go over to Birmingham and I've got to time this just right. If I don't, I'm going to be right in the midst of this. So this was my plan. I'm going to leave the Pell City Airport. I'm going to head to Birmingham. If it looks like it's turning bad, at least it's clear on the east side. I'm going to turn back around and head back to the Pell City Airport, park the airplane and be safe. So we're looking at all the weather data. I'm looking out visually at everything. I'm coming in the land. I can see basically this gust front. It's a shelf cloud out to the, the west of the airport. And I'm constantly asking air traffic control, give me a wind check. I'm listening to the, the ATIS information, but I'm wanting that real-time wind check to make sure nothing is going awry. We land safely, no issue, but within about 10, 15 minutes after that landing. It gets pretty ugly, uh, gusty winds, heavy, heavy rain. It's the kind of situation if you were in a J3 Cub, that airplane would be flying without the engine on, that kind of weather. You know what I'm talking about. You've probably seen those videos. So it comes down to what kind of weather are you comfortable in flying in, personal minimums, have those set in stone, what you are going to do and don't waver, don't waver to those external pressures because there are countless NTSB reports that we read every day where we see someone take off into something that looks like this in a small plane and you wonder, why in the world did they do that? Why did they launch out into something like that when they could have waited 30 minutes, couple of hours, whatever it may be, and let this weather clear? Thanks for checking in this week with Beyond the Briefing. Always encourage your questions, any comments that you may have. Our goal here is to help make you a safer pilot and use all of that weather data that is available today. It's like drinking from a fire hose, but we have more data uh, for meteorology in aviation than we've ever had before. Until next time, we'll see you later. JP.